Ladies and gentlemen, Jazakallah to Sheikh Asim. MashaAllah. Among others, I believe we can summarize that Tawheed is a way of life. Is it not, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, before that, Alhamdulillah, the crowd is full. So for those who just arrived, you may fulfill the seat above there. All right? So Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, the crowd is outstanding, Brother Faisal. MashaAllah, amazing. It's nice to see such a great turnout. I remember, Brother Amin, I used to watch 15 years ago All right. from Peace wow. TV. Okay. And I was looking at actually our next speaker. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. And All I right. was just thinking, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if we have something like this in Malaysia? And to make it more interesting, uh, the host is you. Oh, mashallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Sometimes miracles do happen. Allahu Akbar. Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, brothers and sisters, we strongly encourage all of you to take notes as part of our journey of seeking ilm, as the Prophet himself encouraged us to tie our knowledge through ilm. Now, for those of you who are taking notes, we also would love for you to share on your social media pages. Yeah, if you take any pictures or videos of the event. So please do share in your respective social media pages and hashtag the official hashtag of this event. Okay? So, Brother Hamin, what's the official hashtag of uh, this event? Our official hashtag is PISC, right? PISC? PISC 2024. And also hashtag Light of Tawheed. Light of Tawheed. And to spell Tawheed that is coordinate, it is T-A-W-H-E-E-D. That's right. Right? So this is a, an area of lots of khilaf. We have T-A-U-H-I-D. <laughs> we have T-A-U-H-E-E-D. So let's all be united upon this opinion, which right. is T-A-W-H-E-E-D. -E -E so Allah. let us avoid khilaf in this program. In this program, inshallah. <laughs> and nevertheless, please follow us on Facebook, which is P-I-S-C, Perlis International Sunnah Convention. And uh, Brother Faisal, who will be our next speaker? Oh, our next speaker. If you look on his Facebook page, he did give a promotion on this event. Correct. And he says he is from Putrajaya. Nah, he's from India. Really? Nah, he's from Putrajaya. Now. Ah, I have video evidence. I just saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, he is en enlisted among the 100 most influential people on in India. Mashallah. And uh, he received prestigious Dubai International Holy Quran Awards Islamic Personality in 2013. Uh, the highest award of Malaysia, which is Tokum Al Hijra, Distinguished International Personality Award for the year 2013, and so on and so forth. MashaAllah. So, Amazing. ladies and gentlemen, he will talk about uh, the topic. What is it? So, brothers and sisters, we heard how Sheikh Asim Al Hakim mentioned that Tawheed is not just something theoretical, it's something Correct. that we live and breathe. Mm -hmm. It should be a way of life, which leads into the topic of our next speaker. The implication of Tawheed in human life Masha for all of us. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Dr. Zakir Naik. The last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 38, in every age have we sent. A revelation. Have we sent a book? Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Allah Rasulillah wa Ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yukul lahu kufwana. Rabbi shalli sadri. Wa yisilli amri. Wa ahlul ugdat min lisani yafqaw kawli. My respected mashayik. My respected elders. And my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's a pleasure and honor for me to be invited as a guest speaker to the Perlis 
International Sunnah Convention 2024. And the theme of this convention is the light of Tawheed. The first time I came to this auditorium was during my first visit in Perlis in 2017. And the name of this auditorium, it is the largest in Perlis. It is Davasan 2020. I was wondering, in 2017, I'm in an auditorium named 2020. Now, I'm in 2024, in an auditorium named 2020. And Alhamdulillah, Perlis has become my second home since I came, since I settled in Malaysia, since 2017. Every year I've been coming, except 2020. because of the COVID pandemic. The topic of my talk today morning is the implications of Tawheed in human life. <clears throat> Before I dwell into the topic, I would like to ask you a question. Have you ever thought, why are we here? Why are we here in this world? What is the purpose of our life. I would like to ask you, and please raise your hand, has anyone of who of you have thought, which of you have thought, why are we here? What are we doing on this earth? What is the purpose of our life? Please raise your hand. I can see maybe 20, 30 hands raised. Out of a few thousand people, okay, there's a few hands, 40, 50 hands, not bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, gives the reply in Surah Dariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 56. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. So the main purpose of our life is ibadah, worship of our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've given a talk on this topic, purpose of life. If time permits, you do watch it or you may watch it also. So the main purpose of a life and the only purpose of a life is ibadah, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you read the glorious Quran, the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the glorious Quran, almost all the verses directly or indirectly, they're connected with Tawheed. And Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 6, hadith number 5015, the Prophet said, Surah Ikhlas is equal to one third of the Quran. Imagine four verses of the Quran out of 6,236 verses. It is 0.064%. Four verses of the Quran out of 6,236 is 0.064%. And our Prophet said it is one third of the Quran, 33.33%. Because this Surah class, its main concept is Tawheed. And we'll discuss that later during my talk. Tawheed means Unification. It means asserting oneness. It derived from the word wahda, which means to unite, to unify, to consolidate. The organizers told me that I should list the verses of Tawheed in the Quran and the Sayyid Hadith. Let me tell you at the starting of my talk that the word Tawheed by itself, Tawheed, doesn't exist anywhere in the Quran. The word Tawheed by itself. Neither it is present anywhere in any of the Sahih Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad. But the concept is there. The derivative of the word Tawheed is there in the Quran, like Ahad, meaning one. Wahid, uh, Ahad means the one and only. Wahid means the one. Or Wahada means himself alone. The word Ahad occurs in the Quran once in Surah Class. Chapter number 112. Verse number 1. 
The second derivative, Wahid, occurs in the Quran more than 20 times. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 133. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 163. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171. In Surah Mahindra, chapter number 5, verse number 73. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 31. In Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, verse number 39. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 16. In Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 48. In Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 14. It's mentioned in Surah Kahaf, chapter number 18, verse number 110. In Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 108. It's then Surah Kabu, chapter number 29, verse number 46. In Surah Safa, chapter number 37, verse number 4. In Surah Saad, chapter number 38, verse number 5. In Surah Saad, chapter number 38, verse number 65. In Surah Azumur, chapter number 39, verse number 4. In Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 16. And in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 6. It occurs in the Quran no less than 21 times. The word Wahid, one. And the word Wahada, it occurs five times in the Quran. In Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 46. In Surah Azumar, chapter number 39, verse number 45. In Surah Shora, chapter number 42, verse number 12. Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 12. Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 84. And in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 4. It occurs no less than five times. In Hadith, the derivatives like you are, like you are, occurs many times. It's there in Sahih Bukhari, volume number six, Hadith number 5015, and in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, Hadith number 111. Tawheed can be divided into three categories, though this is not my topic. The other speakers will speak, but I have to speak about it in brief so that you understand the implications of Tawheed in human life. Tawhid is divided into three categories. Tawhid al-Bubiyah, Tawhid al sifat and Tawhid al -Ibada. I'll just speak one or two lines of each because that's not my topic. Tawhid al -Bubiyah is derived from the Arabic word Rab. means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator, sustainer and cherisher. Everything in the world depends on him and he is independent of everything and anything. Tawhid al -Bubiyah. Tawhid al asma sifat has got five categories. Number one, the description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can only give the way he or his prophet has described him. You cannot give your own description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, you cannot give names to Allah except what Allah and his prophet have given him. You cannot say Allah is al ghadib The Quran says Allah gets angry. But you cannot say the angry one because the Prophet and Allah never gave that name to him. You cannot give the attributes of the creation of Allah to Allah. You cannot say he repented like the Bible says God repented. That's the quality of his creation. Allah cannot repent. You cannot give the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creation. You cannot say I know a person who is absolutely eternal. No beginning, no end. That is the quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you cannot give the name of Allah to any of his creation. You cannot call anyone Ar-Rahim. If you have to call, you have to add Abd before it. Abdul Rahim. Abdullah. In brief, this is Tawid al sifat And Tawid al ibadah means that besides believing in Allah, you only worship him and no one else. If you believe in the first two categories of Tawheed, Tawid al-Rububiya, Tawid al sifat At the same time you worship somebody else, you're breaking the third rule of Tawid al-Ibadah. He only deserves worship and no one else. 
And the Quran gives this example in Surah Yunus chapter number 10, verse number 31, that when you ask the pagans, who is the one who controls everything from the heaven and the earth? Who is the one that controls the hearing and the sight? Who is the one who gives life to the dead and death to the life? Who is the one who controls all the efforts? They will say, the mushrik will reply, Allah. Then why are you deluded from the truth? Allah gives the message in Surah Zukhruf, chapter number 43, verse number 87. When you ask them, ask the mushriks, the pagans, who is your creator? They say Allah. Then why do you worship somebody else? So here Allah is giving the example in the Quran that the mushriks, they believed in one Allah. They believed in Toidar Wubia, Toidar Smasifat, but they worshipped other gods besides Allah. Therefore Allah says in Surah Yusuf chapter number 12, verse number 106, most of the people worship not Allah without associating partners with him. That means most of the human beings, they worship Allah, but along with associating partners with Allah. So you find that even the non-Muslims believe in God, believe in Allah, but they associate partners with him. And if you break any one of the three categories of Tawheed, it is called as Shirk. It is the biggest sin in Islam. Associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the biggest sin in Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, that Allah forgiveth not anyone associating partners with him. Anything else, if he pleases, he will forgive. For anyone who has associated partners with God, with Allah, it is the most heinous sin. Allah repeats the message in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 9 and 16, that Allah forgiveth not anyone joining gods with Allah. Anything else, if he pleases, he may forgive. But anyone who has joined God with Allah, he has strayed far away. So shirk is the biggest sin in Islam. And Imam Abdahabi in his book Al-Qabair, even he mentions shirk as the biggest qabair, biggest sin in Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maidah, chapter number 5, verse number 72, لَقَدْ قَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ هُوَ الْمَصِيبُ نُمَ رِيمَا They say, the Christians, that Allah most gracious, they say, that they are doing kufr. Those who say that Allah is Jesus, the son of Mary. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحِ But said Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِلِ O children of Israel, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inno ma yashrik billah. Anyone who associates partners with Allah, faqad haram Allah alayhi al-jannah. Allah will make jannah haram for him. Wama wa nar, wama li zalmi min asar. And fire shall be dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Inno ma yashrik billah. Anyone who associates partners with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ لِيَوْ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannat haram for him. وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِزَوْلِمِ لِنَنْسَارِ And fire shall be his dwelling place and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. So this was in brief the three categories of Tawheed and if you break any one of the categories you are doing shirk which is the major sin in Islam. Let's discuss the implication of Tawheed in human life. First, we'll discuss Tawheed and Alibada. Ibada comes from the root word Abd, meaning slave. Ibada means worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people have a misconception that only Salah, Zakat, Ramadan, the five pillars of Islam and Ibadah. Yes, they are the high category of Ibadah. But any commandment of Allah you follow, you are doing Ibadah. If you follow the commandments of Allah given in the Quran, you are doing Ibadah. If you abstain from things which Allah has prohibited, you are doing Ibadah. Let's first discuss the five pillars and then we'll discuss the other things. Number one is Tawheed. The most important sentence in the life of every Muslim or should be in the life of every human being is Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abdur Rasul. I bear witness 
that there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the slave and messenger of Allah. It is Tawheed and Risala together. It is the most important sentence in the life of any human being. And every Muslim should say this. And if it is the last sentence before you die, Allah promises you Jannah. The implication of this Tawheed is that if you are on Tawheed, Allah promises you Jannah. And the main purpose of life is Ibadah. This life is the test for the hereafter. The second pillar is Salah. A true believer, his life revolves around Tawheed. Every action, every thing, every deed, inshallah we'll discuss. The implication is Tawheed. And every Muslim has to pray minimum five times a day. A life revolves around Tawheed. If you go to the Gulf country, you ask for an appointment, the appointment will be related with Salah. Okay, half an hour before Zohar, okay, one hour before Zohar, one hour after Zohar, before Asar. It revolves around that. And there is no appointment more important than the appointment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when you have an appointment with a, someone who is great, you want to meet a minister, you see it, you get 10-15 minutes before. If you want to meet the prime minister or the king, you go half an early. You want to see to that, no, you want time. But no one is greater than our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So salah, five times a day, it disciplines your life. The implication is, whatever happens, if it's a call for prayer, you leave everything. And our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet, she says in a hadith, that the Prophet, when he's with me and wives, he's so engrossed and so loving, as though everything Avi. But the moment he hears the Adhan, he leaves everything and walks as though what happened? Because he heard the call of Allah. And he goes to the mosque. This is the implication of Tawhid in your life. But unfortunately, every one of us doesn't do that. Or most of us doesn't do that. Many people say, you can call me 24 by 7. You want to meet me? You can meet me 24 by 7. This statement is an ignorant statement. And when really is an important person, and I want to meet him any time, I say you can meet me any time except during the time of Salah. I never tell anyone 24 by 7. 24 by 7 is only for Allah. Besides Allah, no one else can I say 24 by 7, not even my wife. Not even my son. But it's a common statement we say in English, 24 by 7. So in future, remember, if he's the only important person, okay, you can call me. Because Salah is every day of your life, minimum five times. And other most of times are there. Salah is the best example of universal brotherhood. What is the implication in the life of this Tawheed? A prophet said, when you stand for Salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. So when we Muslims stand for Salah, whether black or white, yellow or brown, rich or poor, king or pauper, when you stand for Salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder. Universal brotherhood. Feet to feet and shoulder to shoulder. Imagine it removes the barrier of racism, of wealth, of color, black or white, yellow or brown. Rich or poor. This is the implication of Tawheed in your life. For more details, you can refer to my talk, Salah, the programming towards righteousness. Because every aspect you can speak for us together. And I've been giving one hour to speak on all the implications of Tawheed, which is next to impossible. I'll just scratch the surface of some of the aspects. The third pillar of Islam. Zakah. Every rich person who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold, more than the Nisab level, should give 2.5% of his saving every lunar in charity. If every rich human being in this world gives zakah, 
charity will be eradicated from this world. When we give zakah, it's an obligatory fard charity. Most of the time, it's 2.5%. You have to give. And Allah says in the Quran, who is the one who can give a beautiful loan to Allah and he will multiply it to you? Does Allah require a loan? Allah does he require a loan? What does he mean by this verse? That means if you see a poor man, you give charity. If you see someone who wants some money, you give it to him as loan, as though you are giving it, not Allah doesn't require, you are giving because Allah commands you. When Allah says, who is there to give a loan to Allah? Allah doesn't require. To him belongs everything. It means Allah is checking, do you follow his commandment or not? Do you help the poor people or not? Do you see to it that you fulfill the needs of the poor people or not? When you give food to a needy, you're feeding Allah. Allah doesn't require to be fed. Allah says in Surah Anam chapter 6, verse 104, He feeds everyone but does not require to be fed. Surah Anam chapter 6, verse number 14. So here, when you're giving zakat, it's the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I say, zakat is fard. Additional charity is mustahab. It is mustahab. So minimum, if you give 2.5%, it is your minimum Muslim. But if you give more, you are a better Muslim. And I tell the people that zakat is fard. But try and give more charity. Okay, give 10% of your income. Or give 20% of your income. And the more percentage you give to Allah, the balance with you will be more in quantity than the earlier. And I told my son that when you do business, minimum you should give 51%. Why? Make Allah your partner in business. In business. And you cannot make Allah a small partner. 10%, 20%. If Allah is a partner, he has to be a major shareholder. So minimum 51%. He knows how much I give, but mine is a different case. It's a different level. He's just starting business. So minimum you have to give 51% of your profit every year to Allah in charity. Minimum. Because if you make Allah the partner in business, you cannot make him a small partner. He should be the major shareholder. Then you keep on increasing. 60%, 70%. The more you increase, the balance that will be with you will be bigger. I remember that in Bombay, where I lived more than seven years back, I used to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, Ya Allah, let my life and wealth be sacrificed in the way of Allah. So when we did Hijrah in 2016, because I'm a die, I had to leave my country for sake of Allah. It's a sunnah of the Prophet. What we did, all my wealth went away. Hundreds of millions of ringgit. We left it. I prayed to Allah, Ya Allah, you fulfill half my dream. I'm waiting for Allah to fulfill the next half. My wealth is gone. I'm waiting for my life to be sacrificed. I was telling my friend just a few days back, I prayed to Allah that whatever the assets of the Ummah there in the country, let us get back. But as far as my wealth, I don't want it back. He's saying, why? Because I have already invested in the way of Allah. If I get it back, I'm afraid I may not get the reward in the year after. So never do I pray because my wealth in India was taken away by a non-Muslim government because I'm a die. So whatever hundreds of millions of ringgits you have sacrificed, I don't want it back. Because I know in Akhira, I'll get minimum 700 times or more. So this is the implication of Tawheed. That if you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not bothered about wealth. You're bothered about Akhira. Allah says, if you strive for dunya, Allah gives you dunya. If you strive for Akhira, Allah gives you Akhira and dunya both. Within the next few years, we did businesses, Allah got part of the wealth back to me, not from India. I'm a die full time for the sake of Allah, maybe two hours a week, two, three days a month I do business, and Allah blesses me. 
the fourth pillar of Islam, that is Psalm, the Ramadan, that every lunar year in the month of Ramadan, we have to fast, abstain from food, drink, and sex from dawn to sunset. It's an overhauling of your body once a year. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 183, that Allah has prescribed for you fasting as he had prescribed to people, be people before you so that you may learn self-restraint, so that you may learn piety, so that you may learn taqwa. So the main purpose of fasting, the fourth pillar of Islam, it's not for dieting. The main reason is taqwa, to increase the taqwa. And other reasons are there, but the main number one reason is taqwa. By the time your health will increase everything, but that is secondary. That's the desert, not the main dish. The main dish of fasting is increasing taqwa. I have a series of Ramadan I did with Dr. Sakir. It's a long series of 62 episodes of half an hour, 64 episodes, 32 hour series. It gives the details how does Tawheed, only during Ramadan, it implicates your life. What are the implications? It's for 32 hours, series of 32 hours. Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. The last pillar of Islam, Hajj, that every adult Muslim who has the health and the means should do it at least once in his lifetime. Go to Makkah and, and Mina and Arafah and Muzdalifah during the month of Hajj, from the 8th to the 13th, once in his lifetime. It's the best example of universal brotherhood. More than 4 million people from all over the world, from India, from Pakistan, from Indonesia, from USA, from Japan, from Malaysia, from all over the world, the men are dressed in two pieces of unclone, unsown white cloth. You cannot identify the person next to you whether he's a king or a pauper. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Here I am, O Lord. Here I am at your service. It's an implication. And once you perform Hajj, imagine the people who perform Hajj the first time and if they do it correctly, as for the Quran and Sunnah, their life changes. This was in brief about the five pillars. But as I mentioned, Ibadah does not only mean the five pillars of Islam or, you know, the farad that Allah has told us. If you follow any commandment of Allah, that's Ibadah. If you abstain from anything which he has prohibited, it is Ibadah. A Muslim, whatever he says, it, is all, it should be connected with Allah. He starts anything, he says, Bismillah. He commits anything, he says, Inshallah. He sees something excellent, he says, MashaAllah. He wants to pray something, he says, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. He wants to ask for forgiveness, he says, Astaghfirullah. Any calamity takes place, Inna lillahi inna rajul. Allah is there everywhere. The implication of Tawheed in an individual's day-to-day -day life Everything he utters, directly and indirectly, should be connected with Tawheed. The action he does, directly and indirectly, should be connected with Tawheed. If your actions are not connected with Tawheed, you say, I want to give charity, so people say, I am a generous person. That's not Tawheed. A person who's on Tawheed, I want to give charity to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can even convert your general day-to-day -day worldly activities into Ibadah. Becoming a doctor, there is no Quranic verse or this saying becoming a doctor is good. Oh, I want to become a doctor so that I can help the poor people. I can give them free treatment. Your niya, then becoming a doctor becomes mustahab. From Muba, which is optional, your niya converts it into mustahab. Taking rest, normally sleeping is Muba. But if you say, no, I will sleep early so that I get up for Tahajjud, your sleeping also becomes the Nibada. 
Your every action of your life, if you are on Tawheed, it gets converted into Ibadah. So your every action is based on Niyah. Inna mal amala bin Niyah. So everything you do and anything you do, you have the correct intention, it gets converted into Ibadah. Anything. Even if it's Mubah, even if it's optional, if your Niyah is indirectly connecting with any of the commandments of Allah, the commandments of the Prophet, that Muba act becomes Ibadah. So if a person is on Tawheed, he tries and connects every action to Ibadah. I've come from this conference so that I can spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every action you do, try to see it, make your niyyah with, connected with the Quran, connected with the Hadith, connected with the commandments of the Prophet. The moment you connect it, that Muba act, optional act, becomes an ibadah. As a society, if you're on Tawheed, the implication is that society is free of alcohol and drug. If you're on Tawheed, that society is free from fornication, adultery, free from prostitution. That society is free from nudity, from immodesty. Unfortunately, even the few countries following Tawheed and implicating it, now they are changing their rules. Because they are going away from Tawheed. If you come towards Tawheed, your society will become better. Alcohol free, drug free, prostitution free, adultery free, fornication free. Now you have countries which want Tawheed, allowing alcohol, allowing immodesty, removing hijab. Because they are going away from Tawheed. Tawheed makes your life better, the society better. It frees the society from terrorism. It frees the society from poverty. It frees the society of racism. And the list is long. I have given the tongue Islam the solution for humanity. It gives the details of all these things. And we see today. Today, the best example that we have in the time of the Prophet is the best example of living Tawheed in the world. And we will talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mercy to humanity. The Sahabas, the Khulfa Rashidin are the next. Then the Sahabas. Ambiya the number one. The Khulfa Rashidin number two. Then the Sahabas. Of course, there are topics on Sahaba and Tawheed. I won't touch on that. But when you look at the lifestyle, we are nothing. When the Prophet told the Sahabas that contribute something for jihad, Hazrat Umar may Allah be pleased with him. He comes and gives wealth. He said, this is 50% of my wealth. The Prophet asked, what did you leave home? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I give 50% to you, 50% I kept it at home. MashaAllah, very good. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. He comes and he gives his contribution. The Prophet asks him, what did you keep at home? He said, I gave everything. I kept Allah and his Rasul at home. The level of Tawheed of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him is the highest after the Ambiyas. That is the reason the Prophet said, keeping Hazrat Abu Bakr on one side, may Allah be pleased with him, and the full Ummah on the other side, Hazrat Abu Bakr will be higher on the scale than the full Muslim Ummah except the Ambiyas. Then the Prophet said, the Hazrat Umar may Allah be pleased with him. He kept on one scale. On the other scale, leave aside the Ambiyas and Abu Bakr may Allah be pleased with him. The full Muslim Ummah, Hazrat Abu Bakr alone will be heavier. One person, more than the full Ummah except Ambiya. The second person, better than the full Ummah except Ambiya and Hazrat Abu Bakr. See the level. We are nothing. If you see the lifestyle of the Sahaba, the way we are enjoying life is nothing. Recently, in the last 112 days, what we noticed, and when I say 112 days, it is starting from 7th of October 2023. Most of us know about the attack of Israel on Palestine, on Gaza. And we know that for the last 112 days, more than 25,000 
Palestinians in Gaza have been killed, out of which more than two thirds were women and children. More than two thirds, more than 67% were women and children. Innocent people. But it's the first time in the history of the world there is a genocide going on, and that genocide is being telecast live on the social media. There are many genocides done before. Many, we know it. But this is the first time in the history of humankind, the people that on whom genocide is being done, they are telecasting its life. Because today, the world has become a global village. You see on the WhatsApp, on the Facebook, on the Instagram, on Twitter, live telecast of innocent women, children, men being killed more than 25,000 in the last 112 days from 7th October to the 27th October 2023 to the 27th of January 2024. And when we see the statements and we hear the statement, a heart cries and they are an example today. That imagine a child who is more injured than the father. That child is telling the father, Father, don't worry. Allah is with us. Imagine the child who is more injured than the father is telling, Father, don't worry. Allah is with us. The mother who is there after two or three children have been martyred, she is complaining to Allah, thanking Allah. That good you have martyred, my children have become martyrs. Why didn't you take me also? See the taqwa. You find on these live telecast, the Palestinians of Gaza, the way they are thanking Allah, it is not imaginable for a person who does not know Tawheed. That is the reason. When thousands and millions of non-Muslims, when they are watching this, they are asking, what type of faith is this? The house is being destroyed? They are thanking Allah. The limb is being cut? They are thanking Allah. They are on the deathbed? They are thanking Allah. People are being martyred, being killed. Their relatives are thanking Allah. What type of belief is this? What type of iman is this? Most of the human beings will complain to Allah. They are thanking Allah. Only reason is because of Tawheed. They know that this life is a test for the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah di khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. So when death approaches, they are not afraid. Only person who cannot be afraid of death is a person who is afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person who is afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not be afraid of anything else. Ibn Qayyum, may Allah have mercy on him. He said, if a person who fears Allah, he will not fear anything else. A person who does not fear Allah, he will fear anything and everything. If you don't fear Allah, you may fear of poverty, you may fear of life, you may fear of death, you may fear of this, you may fear of anything and everything. But if you fear Allah alone, alone is important. Now, if you fear Allah and something else, then it is partnership. So if you fear Allah alone, you will not fear anything. It's not haram to fear of flood or earthquake, it's not haram. But if you fear Allah alone, all these calamities, you will never be afraid of. You will only say, Alhamdulillah. A true woman, if some prophet takes place in his business, he says, Alhamdulillah. If some loss takes place, he says, Alhamdulillah. Prophet thanking Allah, loss. Thank Allah, only 10% loss. It could be more. So when you see these Palestinians, the people of Gaza, they fill our heart with tears. And believe me, in this test, Allah is testing the full Muslim Ummah, the Palestinians, especially of Gaza. They are doing Fardi Kifaya. They are protecting the third holiest site in Islam, Masjid Aqsa. They are doing Fardi Kifaya. If they would not have been there, it would have been further than us to go there. 
They are doing further kefaya. And the most powerful country in the world, USA, is supporting them with the best fighters and Iron Dome everything. And yet, they are fearlessly fighting them. Why? Why? They have money. They have power. They have Allah. This is the implication of Tawheed. Life example, we hear in the stories, you know, Sahaba, etc. Yes, Alhamdulillah, highest level. But now Allah is giving us an example in the people of Gaza. The Muslims of Gaza, most of them, almost all, if not everyone. They are giving us an example of what Tawheed is. What is its implication? We are living in a condition, mashallah. If their condition goes off, then we start sweating and we start complaining. Their houses have been destroyed. One million people have been displaced. What is the result? Someone asked me a question. I have a session every fortnight. Ask Dr. Sakir that why is Allah not helping the Palestinians to win the war against Israel? The answer is long. I'll just give a shot. For Allah to make them win, easy kun for your kun. Allah is testing them. These Palestinians, more, almost all of them are passing with flying colors. Allah is testing us. What are we doing? What are we doing? It's a shame on the Muslim Ummah. When they're killing innocent people, breaking all international laws of war crime. Nothing. Little protest here and there, that's it. Will we pass the test? You have to answer yourself. On the day of judgment, when Allah will ask you, what have you done? What have I done? The Palestinians of Gaza, they have passed the test with flying colors. What about us? It's an introspection. So the higher level of Tawheed you have. Oh, if I support Palestinian, my Facebook will be stopped. My YouTube will be stopped. And there are, according to me, if 25,000 Palestinians have died, more than 25,000 non-Muslims all over the world have accepted Islam only because of watching the clips of Palestine, of Gaza. Those Westerner non-Muslims, they are thinking, what is the Iman they have? I want to have that faith. What type of religion they are following? Who is this Allah? Which book are they following? They are starting in the Quran. In Less than three months, more than 25, I'm saying more than 25,000 for safety because I'm a man of figures. It may be much higher, much higher. According to the president of the European Council, only in France alone, in the first two months, 20,000 accepted Islam. I'm not quoting him because I cannot verify statements, so I don't quote him. But I know being a man of media. And if more than a million people have been displaced in Gaza, more than 2 million lives have been affected in Gaza. Do you know tens of millions of non-Muslims that started supporting Palestine have come closer to Islam because of the Palestinians? Never in the history of humanity has it happened that millions of non-Muslims in Western countries, in America, in Europe, all over the world, non-Muslims coming out in protest supporting Palestine, the Palestinians. Allah's plan. So this is the implication of Tawheed. If you have faith in Allah, if you believe in Tawheed, whatever come, you say Alhamdulillah. A person on Tawheed can never be disappointed. Happiness is a state of mind. He's always happy, always thankful. As far as the prohibitions related to Tawheed, which is against Tawheed, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 90, Ya ayyo ladhina amunu, O you believe, inna mal khamru al maithuru, most certainly intoxicant and gambling. Wal anzabu al aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich to memory shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First then you will come to fliyun, abstain from the handiwork that you may prosper. Allah is here saying, Oh, you believe? Intoxicating gambling, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, talking about fortune telling. 
and worship. It's haram. Fortune telling, talking about future, it is prohibited in Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 102. Allah says that anyone, anyone who involves in black magic, he has done a major sin. And the hadith of the Prophet in Sahih Bukhari, that amongst the major sin is associating partners with Allah and witchcraft. So black magic, witchcraft, sorcery, it's a major thing. Imam al dahabi puts it as number three after shirk, murder, then witchcraft, sorcery, black magic. So black magic is the third major sin in Islam. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's Hadith of Musad Ahmad, Hadith number 7045, that if anyone is going to do an act, a good act, and if he deters it because of a bad omen, it is shirk. Our beloved Prophet said, in Arabic, meaning having or doing a good deed, and you see a thing and you think it's a black omen. The Prophet said, if tayar, it is shirk, three times. And everyone has this, but if he has faith in Allah, he avoids it. For example, you're going for an examination, a black cat passes. Oh, bad omen, I will not go for the examination. This is shirk. It is shirk and Islam. And hadith, Asunan Abu Daud, hadith number 3910, as I said, that deterring because of bad omen, it is shirk. Sunan Abu Daud, volume number 4, hadith number 3915, says there is no adwa and no attayar. There is no bad omen, but there is al-fail, good thinking, optimism. That yes, if you see a good sign, no problem. There is nothing like bad omen. It's mentioned in Muslim Ahmad that there are 10 people who come to give shahada, allegiance to the Prophet. Prophet takes the bayah of nine people, one he does not. So people ask him, why didn't you take of the last person? So he says, because he's wearing an amulet and he takes his hand from the shirt and he cuts the amulet and he says, anyone who wears an amulet, a taviz, it is shirk. And the implication of tawheed in human life, there are various Time is limited. I've been in one hour. But normally, when you lead a life, people, they are, have some center. Some people are self-centered. Everything is themselves. I, I, I. Self-centered. Some people are society-centered. No, some people are family-centered. My mother is everything in the world. Allah says in the Quran, That we have ordained for you that you worship none but him. In Surah Isra chapter 17, verse 20, 24. And Allah says in another place that we have ordained that you be good to your parents. Your mother breastfed you for two years. But the next verse says that if your parents tell you to worship somebody else besides Allah, of which you have no knowledge, do not obey them. But live with them with love and companionship. So then Kabut. Chapter number 29. So here, yes, you have to respect your parents, but not above Allah. You cannot say everything is your mother. Some people, the wife is everything for themselves. They will buy a diamond necklace for them, even if they can't afford. Bank borrow steel, I'll buy it for her. Because the wife is everything in the world. For some people, the son is everything in the world. And if he wants to go to a foreign country like America, even if the degree is useless, he wants to say, my son is studying in America. You know, when I, when I go to Gulf countries, when I meet this top businessman, they boast, you know, my son is studying in Harvard University. Ah, I said, hmm? Studying in Stanford University, Oxford University. I'm telling Yashik when I go to Saudi Arabia. 
You are sending your son to America? To UK? I have sent my son from India to Riyadh, Jamutul Imam. My son is studying in your country, Jamutul Imam. According to me, it's one of the best universities in the world. And they feel ashamed. You are sending your son. I ask them a simple question. If you send your son to Harvard, Oxford, and you send your son to Jamil al Imam, or Islamic University of Medina, which will benefit you more? The Prophet said, when you die, three things live. The wealth you have spent, the knowledge you have spent, and your righteous sons, righteous children praying for you. So if your son goes to Harvard University and prays for you, or if son goes to Jamil al Imam, or Islamic University of Medina and prays for you, which will benefit you more? This is the problem. Your center is dunya. Your center is your children. Your center is your society. Some people are society centered. They only bother what their neighbor are doing. They are in competition with their neighbor. Only with their neighbor. There's an anecdote. Once an angel comes and asks and tells a person, whatever you ask, I'll give you, but I'll give your neighbor double. So he said, oh angel, Give me a Rolex watch. So he gets a Rolex watch. Very happy. But the neighbor gets two Rolex watch. He says, Oh, angel, give me a Rolls Royce. So the angel gives him the Rolls Royce and gives the neighbor two Rolls Royce. Huh? Then he prays to the angel, Angel, give me a very big villa, bungalow of 10 bedroom. Angel gives him a villa, bungalow of 10 bedroom, but gives the neighbor two. He's thinking, what is happening? Then he says, oh angel, break my one eye so that I cannot see. Attitude. He's telling the angel to break his one eye. You know why? So that the angel will break both the eyes of the neighbor. He is more bothered about winning with the neighbor than his own lifestyle. This is neighbor centered. Competition with the neighbor. Imagine. He doesn't mind. Making his one eye blind so that his neighbors, both his eyes are blind. This is the problem. You are more, you are more bothered about your friend, pleasing your friend, not pleasing Allah. You are more bothered about pleasing your colleague, not Allah. You are material centered. Many people are materialistic, material centered. They want to, whenever they meet with their friends, they talk. Oh. I have a watch, Tagore, Tagore, I have Omega, I have a Rolex, Hublo, oh. what is a bezel? How many diamonds does it have? I have a latest edition of Patek Philip. Oh, Patek Philip. So the main discussion is watches. If you go to higher level, they are discussing what cars you have. I have a BMW Porsche, no, no. I have a Maybach, or Ferrari, Lamborghini. Oh, I have a Bugatti. So this is the main discussion. They spend hours on that. If you go high level, yacht, I have a luxury liner. You go high level, you have jet planes. Talking about jet planes, which plane do you have? I have a private jet plane. Oh, how many seater? 13? I have a bigger one. Which one do you have? Gulfstream? Oh, I have a 373. Oh. This is a Time always discussing materialistic things. They are material centered. Some people are fame centered. They want to get famous. They want to get popular. So they give money for degrees. You know, you give money, you get degree. Doctor, you can get. That also you can get if you have money. Some, some fame centered. Popularity. How many followers do you have on the Facebook? On the YouTube, on Instagram, what's the following you have got? This is the discussion, popularity. A true Muslim is only Allah centered. And when you're Allah centered, all this is combined together. You get everything of all what I've spoken. If you're Allah centered, what will you think? You'll not be self centered. Allah says, a believer will always want something similar, what he wants for his other believer. A believer will always want the same. So you will never be self-centered. So if you are Allah-centered, self-centered means I will want good for my friend, for my believer, so I will benefit. So this is self-centered if you are Allah-centered. Family-centered? 
if you're family centered, do you love your parents? Because the Prophet said, paradise lies beneath the feet of a mother. You respect her. But if they tell you to do against Allah and His Rasul, you will not follow them. If you're Allah centered, you'll take care of your parents, of your wife. Our beloved Prophet said, the best woman is he, the best believer is he, who's best to his family, especially his wife. So if you're Allah centered, you love your parents, your mother, your father, your wife, your children. It's a package. You'll be society centered. You love your neighbor. The Prophet said, you are not a believer if you sleep with a full stomach and your neighbor sleeps with an empty stomach. The Sahaba asked, who's your neighbor? The Prophet said, 40 houses next to you. So here you're competing with your neighbor. Better watch, better house. You want to break your eyes so that his two eyes are broken. Here, you want to secure your neighbor. He's a good Muslim who's a good neighbor. So if you're Allah-centered, all these things completely change. If you're Allah-centered, you wonder that the fame you're getting, who is the most famous man in the world? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Did he do it for it? No. He always did astaghfar. Always asking for forgiveness. A person who has been forgiven by Allah, the best human being in the world, the best messenger in the world, yet he is asking Allah for forgiveness every day, minimum 100 times. The Sahabas were worried that will their popularity make them get less reward in the Akhirah? So they are afraid of popularity. They don't want to become leaders. Today people don't become leaders. They'll do anything to become the leader. Here, the Sahaba used to run away from becoming the leader because they knew it's a responsibility. So if you're Allah-centered, every Muslim should be Allah-centered. And believe me, all your problems of your life will vanish. And you have an example in the Palestinians. They're Allah-centered. If you become Allah-centered, if I become Allah-centered, believe me, all your problems will vanish because Allah has a solution to all the problems of humankind. If you're Allah-centered, you'll always say Alhamdulillah. You'll always praise Allah. Since time is running short, I may not be able to complete all my points, but a very important point as far as implication the implications of Tawheed in human life is concerned. We always look forward for a profession. And today, the world thinks the best profession is a doctor. Next, maybe engineer or IT, etc. And my mother wanted me to be a heart specialist. I was inspired by Sheikh Didad. Most of you know about it. I chose to become a doctor because it was the best profession. But after me, Sheikh Dizad, I realized that the best profession is not a doctor. The best profession is that of a da'i, calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَحْسُنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ ضَعِي لَلَّهِ وَعَمِلُ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّ لِمِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, walks righteousness and says that I'm a Muslim. So the best profession is of a da'i. What was the profession of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Doctor? Engineer? IT? He was a da'i. Messenger of Allah. And after the messengers of Allah have gone, they will not come. It is the da'is who get the people called people to Allah. Allah says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 104, that let there arise out of your band of people that invite people to the truth. And prevent them from doing what is wrong. One of the main important implications of Tawheed in human life is Dawah. And Allah gives the master key for Dawah. So Imran chapter 3 verse 64, Allah says, Kul yahal kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala wila kalimatin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'uda illallah. That you worship none but Allah. Wala nushika vi shayyam. That we associate no partner with him. Wala yattakhida baaduna baadun arbaabun minillah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. And if they turn back. 
فقولوا شدوا بيننا مسلمون we bear witness that we are Muslims bowing over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this verse of the Quran according to me is the master key for da'wah come to common terms so when you are doing da'wah with the non-muslim you should come to common terms and the most important is Allah na'buda illallah that we worship none but Allah ta'id I tell to all my da'i students while doing da'wah you can start with science and with history no problem but your main focus should be ta'id If you cannot remove the shirk from the life of that non-Muslim, your dawa is useless. You may convince him alcohol is haram, you may convince smoke is haram, he may stop his adultery, he may stop his riba, but he does not stop shirk. Your dawa is useless. He will not go to Jannah. So as a dai, your main aim should be tawhid. You can start with commonalities, science, no problem, but your main aim should be tawhid. If you do not instill tawhid and remove the shirk. from the non muslim of dawa is used this and the most important surah the concept of tawhid is surah ikhlas chapter number 112 verse number 1 to 4 which says qul huwa allahu ahad say is allah one and only allah hu samad allah the absolute and eternal lam yalid wa lam yulad he begets not nor is begotten wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ahad there nothing like him this is a four line definition of allah subhanahu wa taala which is given in the glorious quran any person saying so and so candidate is god if that candidate fits in the four line definition we muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as god number 1 say is allah one and only number 2 allah samad allah the absolute eternal lam yalid wa lam yulad he begets not nor is he begotten wa lam yakul law kuffan this is the touchstone of theology surah ikhlas is the litmus stone of theology in identifying allah this is the litmus test it is the touchstone of theology and doing dawa is a fard in islam surah al asr according to imam shafi if the surah alone was revealed it would have been sufficient for hidayah allah says in surah asr chapter number 103 verse number 1 to 3 i would like to end my talk with the surah wal asr ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر by the token of time man is verily in a state of loss except those who have faith those who have righteous deed those who exhort people to truth and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance there are minimum four criteria for any human being to go to jannah number one iman number two righteous deed number three watawasa bil haqq that is dawa and isla and number four watawasa bil sabr inviting people to patience and perseverance you may be a very good muslim you may be offering five times salah you may be giving zakat you may be fasting in the month of ramadan you may have gone for hajj but if you don't do dawa according to surah al asr you shall not enter jannah if allah wants to forgive you and put you in jannah that's allah progressive allah's progressive but under normal circumstances if you don't do dawa you will not enter jannah you have to be minimum part time dai but the best is a full time dai i would like to end my talk the implication of tawhid in human life the best profession allah says in surah fusilat chapter 41 verse number 33 and my talk ومن حسن قال ممن ضاء الله وعمل صالحا وقال ان المسلمين هو از بيتر ان سبيد ذان ون ان وايز تو ذا وي اوف ذا لورد ووركس نايشنس اند سيز ذات اي ام ا مسلم واخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين